Chapter Ten: Localism and Interdependence. In the minds of many thoughtful people, the prospect of a profusion of municipal assemblies dotting the landscape, each of them making decisions autonomously, raises questions. Direct democracy and participatory citizenship sound very good on paper. They would concede. But the result of such fragmentation would most likely not be popular empowerment, but chaos. Each assembly would probably try to advance its own interests at the expense of all the others. Moreover, they further object, modern industrial societies are too large and too complex to be run by political entities as small as towns and neighborhoods. Economic life, in particular, is interlinked and globalized. Local communities could scarcely be expected to make informed decisions with the efficiency that production and commerce demand. By their very nature, our societies require government on a broad scale, lest they collapse altogether. The state is the perfect instrument for this purpose. We are assured it permits policies to be made and enforced over a wide area. Even those thinkers of a socialistic or utopistic bent. Who wish to replace the competitive market economy of the present society with cooperative ones may have doubts about municipal democracy. No lone municipality, they demur, however democratic, would ever be able to resist the pressures of large economic and class interests on its own. To arrive at a cooperative society, they maintain, a state would be indispensable. Indeed. One with a great deal of power to restrain the unbounded drive for profit of capitalist enterprises. Still, other critics object that small communities, by virtue of their insularity, tend to become parochial. Even in today's interlinked society, localities become complacent about their distinctive and cherished customs. But if their range of political vision were narrowed from the national level, where it rests today. To the comparatively minuscule town or neighborhood level, then they might well withdraw into themselves at the expense of wider consociation. They might become reactionary guardians of local customs that are actually unfair or discriminatory. If challenged, they might become defensive of them or even chauvinistic. A kind of municipal tribalism could spring up, one that shelters injustices or even tyrannies within. The citizens of a chauvinistic municipality could even decide, democratically in a citizens' assembly, voting by majority rule, that only white people could live in their community. They could decide openly to discriminate against people of color. They could decide to exclude women from public life, or gays and lesbians, or any other group. Without the power of a nation-state to enforce anti-discrimination laws, these critics contend, civil rights wouldn't stand a chance. In traditional American politics, it has often been the decentralizing tendencies, calling for states' rights, that have stood for white supremacy and the exclusion of blacks from political life. Finally, those who object to municipalist localism contend environmental problems recognize no man-made political boundaries. Suppose a town is dumping its untreated wastes into a river from which towns downstream draw their drinking water. Such a problem must be handled at a level of jurisdiction broader than the municipality. Only the overarching state, we are told, with the instruments of coercion at its disposal, could prevent the upstream town of ruining the common water supply. Rather than chase these hopelessly utopian schemes of direct democracy, these various arguments all conclude: people who are seeking to create a better society should work to improve the existing system. They should try to enhance popular representation in the state. To be sure. The nation state doesn't give decision-making power directly to ordinary people. We are told, but at least it gives it to their representatives. In general, even if the state is guilty of some abuses, it is necessary in order to prevent wider abuses. On the surface, the statist case may seem compelling. For one thing, it is true that today's world is complex, but society's complexity is not such as to require state control. Much of it is generated by the state itself. As well as by capitalist forms of enterprise, eliminating the nation-state and capitalism would immensely simplify society by eliminating their vast bureaucratic complexities. Second, while discrimination and other human rights abuses may indeed arise in stateless societies, they may also arise in stateless societies, 
and have done so quite often. Nation-states have enforced abuses ranging from racial segregation to apartheid, from slavery to genocide, from child labour to patriarchalism, to the persecution of sexual minorities. Indeed, human rights abuses have most often been perpetrated by states. Finally, it is surely true that many social and environmental problems do transgress municipal boundaries and that no single municipality can address them meaningfully on its own. And it is true that some municipalities may become parochial and transgress on the freedoms of others. Small is not necessarily beautiful at all, and municipal autonomy in itself does not guarantee that municipalities will be enlightened or free. Finally, it is true that the municipality is relatively powerless to challenge broad social forces. Fighting in isolation, it would scarcely pose any threat at all. The statist critics, that is, are correct in their objection to localism as such. But although libertarian municipalism emphasises enhancing local political power, it is not strictly a localist philosophy. It recognises that some kind of trans-municipal form of organisation is needed if citizens are to create and manage a free, democratic society. A thoroughgoing localism and decentralism has consequences at least as unsavoury as those raised by statists. Localism and Decentralism When most current radical environmental political thinkers, for their part, turn to the problem of how to create an alternative society, they think of simplifying lifestyles and constructing simpler habits at a local level that suit those simpler lifestyles. We should give up the pattern of insatiable consumption that society impresses upon us today, they argue, and reconceive ourselves as members of the bioregion. That is, a natural place bounded by a natural boundary, like a watershed or a mountain range. We should reduce the number of possessions we think we need, and society should cast off the technology that is, presumably, ruining the natural world. People in the wealthier nations, in particular, should drastically cut their level of consumption and dismantle the technological base of economic production. Instead of the shopping mall society, we should frame a decentralised society, one in which our home, our own locality, becomes as self-sufficient as we can make it. We should build up local manufacturers using humble tools, we should create local cooperatives like food co-ops, we should cultivate as much of our own food as possible, We should dispense with money if we can and adopt barter or an alternative currency. Local communities that are self-sufficient might then be able to survive on their own, outside the mainstream of society. Gradually, such communities would multiply, creating a more humanly scaled and ecologically friendly society. Such bioregionalist appeals share some points of resemblance with libertarian municipalism, especially in their objections to the competitive economy to commodification and to the creation of artificial needs, and in their wish to reconstruct society along more ecologically benign lines. And both bioregionalism and libertarian municipalism place great importance on enhancing the importance of localities, in that both call for the decentralisation of society, but many of these resemblances are superficial. While libertarian municipalism does seek to reinvigorate the local level, It regards local self-reliance as woefully incomplete as a principle by which to remake society and our relationship with the natural world. No locality, not even the municipality that practices direct democracy, can be sufficient unto itself. While we may strive to decentralise production, complete self-sufficiency is not only impossible but undesirable. Municipalities of all sorts are dependent upon one another, as well they should be, and share many common issues. Least of all should individual communities ever be autonomous in their economic life. Any given individual community needs far more resources, raw materials, than it could derive from its own lands. Economic interdependence is simply a fact. It is a function not of the competitive market economy, of capitalism, but of social life as such, at least since the Neolithic era. Even farmers and craftspeople are interdependent. 
Farmers depend on mines, factories and smithies for the manufacture of ploughs, hoes, shovels and the like, while craftspeople need tools and raw materials from a wide variety of sources. Nor would libertarian municipalism eliminate many existing technologies of production. In fact, it takes issue with the popular eco-mystical belief that technology is the cause of the ecological crisis. Most technologies are morally neutral. Nuclear power of any kind is an obvious exception. It is not that they cause ecological destruction, but the social arrangements, especially capitalism, that use them for destructive ends. Most technologies may be used for ends that are either noble or base. They merely magnify the consequences of the social relations in which they are embedded. Certainly, one noble end for which many technologies are used today is the reduction or elimination of toil. Those who advocate simple living using only the simplest of technologies seem unaware that if a simplified community were to try to produce everything its inhabitants needed using only craft hand tools and simple farming technologies, the days of those community members will be filled with back-breaking toil, of the kind that was prevalent before industrial revolution. Such toil not only prematurely aged pre-industrial people, especially women, it allowed them little time to participate in political life. Indeed, if people are to be able to fully participate as citizens in political life as proposed, they must have an economic and technological base that will afford them sufficient free time to do so. Otherwise, the demands of survival and personal security in the private realm will overtake political participation. Fortunately, creating an ecologically benign and decentralised society would not require a return to relentless toil. Social ecology, the body of ideas of which libertarian municipalism is the political dimension, recognises that the enormous growth of productive forces in modern times has rendered moot the age-old problem of material scarcity. Today, technology has been developed sufficiently to make possible an immense expansion of free time through the automation of tasks once performed by human labour. As far as production is concerned, the basic means of eliminating toil and drudgery for living in comfort and security, rationally and ecologically, for social rather than merely private ends, are potentially available to all peoples of the world. In today's societies, unfortunately, this promise of post-scarcity of a sufficiency in the means of life and the expansion of free time has not been fulfilled, again, not because the technology is base, but because the social arrangements that use it are base. In the present society, automation has more often than not created hardship rather than free time. It usually results in unemployment, in which people are unable to gain the means of life at all or else long hours of work at low-paying service jobs. An ecological society, by eliminating the social arrangements that create both these problems, would fulfil the potentiality of technology to create a post-scarcity society. It would retain much of today's technological infrastructure, including automated industrial plants, and use it for production to meet the basic needs of life. Those plants, as a minimum, would be converted so that they were powered by clean, renewable energy rather than by fossil fuels. Machinery would produce sufficient goods to meet individual needs and remove most onerous toil so that men and women would have sufficient free time to participate in political life as well as enjoy rich and meaningful personal lives. If the potentiality for ending material scarcity has been partially fulfilled by virtue of the development of production, that potentiality will be brought to fulfilment by making the necessary changes in the area of distribution. That is, the fruits of the productive forces would not be appropriated by one group who then make them available to the rest of the world by selling them as they are today. Rather, the fruits of production would be shared they would be distributed according to people's need for them, guided by an ethos of public responsibility as well as by reason. Such sharing implies the existence of communication, tolerance, rejuvenating ideas, a wider social horizon and cultural cross-fertilisation 
which would also help prevent the appearance of chauvinism and bigotry. But in an ecological society, sharing, equitable distribution, would not only be a moral principle. In order for the promise of post-scarcity to be fulfilled, it would have to be institutionalized. It would have to gain concrete social form through a broad principle of organized cooperation. This organized cooperation would emanate from the very interdependence of the democratized municipalities themselves, especially in their economic life, on ecological questions and on issues of human rights. That is, not only would democratized municipalities be interdependent, they would institutionalize their interdependence in a direct democratic way.